Um, I'm very happy to uh, speak here and talk about the geospatial analytics extension that we added to NIME uh, at the Harvard um, Center for Geographic Analysis. Actually, this presentation is uh, prepared for and will be uh, presented to you by not only me, but my colleague, Dr. Ling Bo Liu, who probably is dialing in virtually um, with us here. Um, but his part is uh, presented by a, a recorded uh, a video. So I'll talk a little bit more about why geospatial analytics matter and what we did about it um, and how we decided to go with NINE. Um, Ling Bo's portion of the recorded video um, shows you a few cases of the examples what we built. And then Tobias will tell you the actual product and the timeline and, and uh, when it can be available to all of you. So um, why geospatial analytics matter? There. Um, here's a room full of data scientists, so I don't really need to tell you that, that we're living in the era of the fourth industrial revolution, right? The disrupt, uh, disruptive digital technology is on us, changing our lives profoundly. All these things you know better than I do. But I want to focus on this one point, that geolocation has become ambiguous and place, time, these important properties are now embedded in the data that is streaming towards us. What can we do about it, right? We seem to be really empowered by the data and the technology nowadays, but we are also facing unprecedented challenges in the world, right? Climate change, public health, um, energy, food, water, security, biodiversity, environmental protection, conflicts and crime, all these problems um, has a regional global scale. And understanding these problems and finding a solution for them requires the insight of a complex system on Earth. We are fortunate that data coming in are with the location properties nowadays, the global navigating systems, the GPS, the Earth observation, uh, satellite imageries, um, our, our cell phone, right? Um, the wired internet of things, the smart city. All these are giving us information that has that place and time in there. What can we do about it? How do we use that to solve the problems we face? Everyone knows, well, as data scientists, right, we need to turn data into information, turn information into knowledge, turn knowledge into decisions. And in doing so, knowing where it's the first step that builds the foundation. But that's not enough. When we know where things are happening, we can start to know what the distribution pattern is, how things are interconnected. Do they co-locate? Are they adjacent to each other? Are they connected through networks? What is the causal effect in the space domain? How do you predict what's going to happen where, at what time, right? All that is geostatistical uh, analytics, geospatial analytics. So doing, sometimes we call the geospatial analytics spatial data science, um, almost interchangeable. And doing that, it has a very common, you know, uh, life cycle as any data science uh, that you, you all are in, um, already familiar with. You know, you have the problem, you gather the data, you process it, analyze it, right? explore, model, understanding, visualize, 
and understand the problem better. So it's a life cycle. But the geospatial part of the data adds complexity to this process because the multidimensional nature, it usually is big, it's complex, it's cumbersome to process. So it's even more important for geospatial analytics to have these issues addressed, right? Data access, integrating heterogeneous data, right? Efficient visualization, you know, map to begin with, and many more. Um, high performance computing to be able to crank out computation quickly. Um, reusable, right? Uh, replicable collaboration. All these are more than important, right? That in geospatial analytics than others. And over the years, over the decades, government agencies, industry uh, companies, and academic organizations have all done a lot to support spa spatial data science uh, by data services, right? One-stop shop for the geodata.gov platform. It's no longer exists now. Um, but NOAA has its own one-stop shop for spatial data. Arges Online from S3, a very popular platform. Google Earth Engine from Google, right? And Dataverse is a Harvard uh, open source project. They all provide data repository, download, query, preview, some, some an, uh, online analytical capabilities, and then some uh, also support publishing and even preservation in the, in the case of uh, uh, Dataverse. But it's still limited to just the data piece mostly, right? Just giving you data. And then you still have to handle it. The rest of that life cycle, you still have to handle. And even that, for the data service piece, it's already costly, slow to develop, takes special expertise to, to manage. And then when geospatial analytics comes, it's critically important for supporting many different research domains. And these people may not speak the same language, they may not have the same level of technical skills as their background. So sharing these things is also a challenge. Considering all these, um, Harvard's Center for Geographic Analysis proposed a project uh, with our, our partners, industrial partners, that we, we name it Spatial Data Lab. So it's not just a data service anymore. It's a lab, it's an integrated solution for spatial temporal research that combines the application, the, the training service, uh, combines um, data with analytical capabilities, with education and publication. It's all workflow driven. So data needs to be processed, integrated together, need to be quickly discovered and, and processed, and then explore, analyze, visualize, right? All that can be done in the workflow-based modules. And then the workflow published on, through a server published on web portal allows end users, students learning, application decision makers, right, wanting to rerun the model and solve their problems without having to go under the hood, understand how your model is wired. They can go to the web portal and take this, the, uh, the service from there. So the project is <clears throat> a part of the National Science Foundation sponsored Industry University Collaborative Research Center is a mouthful of terms, IUCRC. Um, and we are one of the many centers, over 100 of them, in different fields. Ours is a spatial temporal innovation center. So NSF funded us to collaborate with industry and government agency and NGOs to develop research products that could quickly embed into production. That's where our sponsorship comes in, NIME, and Future Data Lab, a nonprofit organization based in Michigan. 
Research is conducted at Harvard, and our system is hosted at the Research uh, Computing Cloud at George Mason University, our partner in this uh, Spatial Temporal Innovation Center. Our goal is really to build a platform that could effectively co uh, support collaborative spatial temporal research. We chose LIME because, well, I don't have to say that, right? LIME is great, everybody agree here. Uh, but most important for us is open source because it can be uh, available to educators without the upfront cost. It's open source because we can go in and modify the, uh, the components because it provides the flexibility for us to first embed snippets of other code that we know already working and make that work in the framework of the workflow. And then when, when NIME um, offered that um, opportunity to build native NIME nodes with Python, we jump on it. So the geospatial analytics extension is all like converted from originally snippets of code embedded, now converted into native NIME code. Um, so, and, and most importantly, uh, NIME's openness to collaborate with us. So with that, we built this spatial data lab with NIME as the foundation in the architecture. Um, our researchers start with the, the, pop, uh, the desktop um, uh, analytics build, uh, workflow building module, and then push the workflows up to uh, server, connect to cloud data streams, and then publish on the web portal. Now, training workshop attendees and other collaborators could come in, start from any gadgets that they can get a browser and running these workflows, learning the process and see the results, right? Maps, reports, whatever, charts. And then if they get enticed in it, they can join our team. They can start downloading the desktop module and they can build and they can, they can snowball, expand, you know, not only reproduce, but replicate with their own data or expand with their own code. So the operation snowballs from there. And what we have done is really we, we converted a few very popular college textbooks, making all their lab assignments uh, workflow driven now. And that gave us more than 60 um, case studies, so examples of, with sample data, with workflow, with uh, results already presented. And these case studies become the starting point for other researchers to come in and modify and advance that research. So, with all that talking, let's look at a few of these case studies. They're simplified down for the time limit in this presentation, but hopefully can give you an idea of how the geo geospatial analytics extension work in uh, some you know, problem-based scenarios. We have three cases prepared, and this is prepared by my colleague, Dr. Ling Bodiu. Uh, Center for Geographic Analysis. Case one is about identifying nearby facilities, right? You have a location, you have some criteria, find for me sites that meets my criteria. Case two is site selection based on accessibility, meaning that you have several or many candidate sites you can pick from but then you have certain criteria that you want to pick and choose, minimize customer's travel, or avoid competition, or satisfying other criteria. You put that criteria in there, and, this, and the workflow will pick the most suitable sites among the many you have. So this case was, say, if you want to minimize citizens' travel and you want to vaccinate the whole city of, of, of Austin, which, set number of hospitals are the best ones to put the vaccination capability into. The third case is about 
understanding citizens' um, emotions and sentiments towards um, Hurricane Ian, in this case, in Florida, that just hit, hit Florida last month. Um, and how does that sentiment change over time, pre-hit, pre-landing, post-landing? And try to understand where's the hard hit, where are the, um, the citizens' um, um, emotional reaction to these things. So um, without further ado, then we let, let us look at first case. Location, location, location. This is a popular rule where you want to buy or even some new properties. As the first law of geography says, everything is related to everything else, but near things are more related than distant things. But today, it's lunchtime. Maybe we don't talk about the philosophy of geography. I only care about one thing. What restaurants are near our conference center? Suddenly, it can be transformed into any questions on identification of nearby facilities. To answer this question in mind, we would have those following steps. Firstly, get the address or name of our location, then a geocoding tool to interpret the address text into latitude and longitude. A conversion tool will further generate geometry data based on the coordinates. Then we will use project to give it a new coordinate system, transforming the unit from degree to meters. If we want to know the restaurant in five kilometers, then above a tool will generate a circle with five kilometers as a radius based on our location, which works as a boundary to query the points of interest data from OpenStreetMap. The final tool, Geospatial View, will enable us to see the detailed information of such restaurants. This is a theoretical workflow for this task. In this workflow, we convert the latitude and longitude coordinate values into a geographic data format. The new version of LIME implements support for geographic data columns and the users can switch between different display renders. The coordinate reference system conversion is performed through the projection node, and the unit is converted to meters. Considering the occupability, we set a buffer to 500 meters, set it as, as the search range of the OpenStreetMap POIS nodes, and extract the certain labels as a restaurant, and finally, input a result into a geospatial view for visualization. From the results, you always can say that there is a Thai-style restaurant nearby, but it is too few choice. By the way, since we are at a country on the path, we can drive. We can try setting the distance to five kilometers, run the workflow again. This time, maybe we will have more options. Yes, we do have more options than many Mexican restaurants in the north and in the south near the Colorado River, we have more choices such as sushi or Chinese restaurant Wuzhou. Okay, just enjoy yourself. Luckily, we don't have to go out and drive five kilometers, but um, you get the idea. The second case study is about site selection. Public facilities, companies can profit from a good location. For instance, in Austin, there are many hospitals. If we want to choose five hospitals to vaccine cities in Austin to minimize the total travel cost, how can we answer this question? First of all, we need a population of every census block groups. Then a base map with geometry information will be utilized to combine the population information. Taking the centroid of the census block groups as the representative spatial point, then with a geocoding of hospital locations, a Euclidean distance tool will be applied to calculate the travel cost. The final step is using corresponding site selection tools to solve this question with the arrival of distance and the population. Based on these new nodes in mind, we can build a workflow for this question easily. In this workflow, we use the US Tiger Map node to get the latest base map 
at the block group level for 2020, and the U.S. Census data node to get a population. To use this node, users need to request a free U.S. Census API key, which can also be used in another node, the American Community Survey Five Years Estimate node. Then, we can combine them and convert the polygon feature to some choice. After the transformation of hospital coordinates, we can get a distance between census block group units and hospitals by using the Euclidean distance tool. Then, the p-median tool can be utilized to assign the optimal hospitals to each census block group using the two key variables. We can combine. The result to a random selection based on the partitioning node and the nearest join node. The result showed that the average distance was reduced by 26 percent compared to random selection, equivalent to a reduction of 484 tons of carbon dioxide emissions for all citizens of Austin. Drove to the hospitals, which could probably take more than twenty-four thousand trees to absorb it in a full year. If we have a limited budget, we have to select only three hospitals. In this scenario, we can change the percentage to thirteen percent in the partitioning node, and also set a parameter in the p-median node to three, and rerun the model. At this time, the results show that the p-median average distance got a reduction of 27 percent, equivalent to a reduction of 565 tons of carbon dioxide. So, site selection algorithms do help us to save the money and contribute to global sustainability. In terms of impact analysis, often we want to use multiple data sources to understand spatial events and their impacts. As we all know, just a month ago, Hurricane Ian struck Florida. To understand impact, we need information on Hurricane Ian's trajectory, population, and geotagged trees in Florida. Likewise, the loads for the U.S. Census data and the U.S. Tiger Map. Are for the base maps and population. Multiple rim buffer nodes get buffers at a different distance from the Hurricane Ian track. Overlay is used to assess the population of different buffers. Through twist data collected by Harvard CGA and the spatial join node, we can understand how people feel about Hurricane Ian. Here is a workflow. In the first part of the workflow, the geofile reader is used to read the hurricane route. The multiple rim buffer is used to get the buffer zones affected by the hurricane year. And by dissolving the loads, we can calculate the total population of the different areas. The result shows that the buffer zone from Tampa to Jacksonville was the most populous place. And endure the greatest challenges. The second part of the workflow contains a dataset of over 100,000 geographic trace records, with the keyword Hurricane Ian, pre-processed in Harvard FAS RC, and assigned a sentimental scores. Here we use the Kepler GeoView nodes to help us to visualize it easily. It wraps. The Kepler GL function, we can change the color settings by sentimental score as needed. We can also use filtering to examine time series changes in sentimental scores. We apply spatial joins and divide the trees into two phases, before landing and after landing, with the key date of September 28th. Before the hurricane made landfall. The 50-kilometer buffer zone at the center of Hurricane Ian's predicted path had the lowest sentimental scores, which is understandable. 
while those in the nearby 100 to 150 kilometer buffer zones were very optimistic. But after the hurricane made landfall, the situation was just the opposite. The sentiment of people in the 100 to 115 kilometer buffer zones became relatively negative. The possible reason is that the residents of those buffer zones did not prepare enough for the extra large impact area of Hurricane Ian. These sentimental scores changes in the two stages can further highlight the difference. People who were in the center of the Hurricane Ian's path were obviously relieved and assumed more positive changes like those on the north and the south side of Florida. So the rest of the presentation will be by Tobias. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. And um, yeah. <laughs> thank you also, Ling Bu, for recording this really great uh, use cases that showed the ease of use, but also the breadth and of the functionality of the new geospatial analytics extension for NIME. Um, and as Scott already mentioned, quite a lot of users were asking about this functionality. I'm very happy to announce that this geospatial analytics extension will be available with the next NIME analytics platform release at the uh, beginning of December. And it was already mentioned, so it's a pure Python-based uh, extension. Um, but still, the in uh, installation will be as easy as with any other NIME installation. So you don't need to worry about all of that. Just drag and drop a node on the extension itself from the NIME Hub in the NIME Analytics platform, and um, the NIME takes care in the background for all of the extensions and so on. So the first version will come with support for the most common uh, vector data types, like points, lines, and polygons, and so on. And um, we will release it as a community contribution. And we will work together with the Center of Geographic Analysis and uh, with the community in order to uh, extend the usability and also the functionality of this extension then. And as always, um, your feedback counts, so it's very, very welcome. And it's also important so that we can grow this extension even further there. So please contact us via the NIME forum or also there's a GitHub repository um, where you can also report questions or, or problems so that we can then fix them and, and incorporate them in the next versions, which will definitely come over the next months then. <clears throat> um, so as I said, so the, this is the first version, but it already comes with a lot of functionality that covers all of your geospatial analytics workflows or needs. Um, so we will have nodes that allow you to read uh, standard file formats like uh, shapefiles or GeoJSON files. We have calculation, manipulation, transformation nodes that cover things like um, counting the length of a line, which could be a street on your map, for example, or computing the distance, like we had that in the, uh, in the example there, so that you can uh, compute the distance between different sites, for example, and also uh, nodes that are important if you want to integrate different data sets so that you can uh, harmonize the projection, for example, for different data sets there. Um, and we have also conversion nodes. So Uh, with the next release, NIME comes with a new geospatial type that is very efficient, but we also provide nodes that allow you to convert to all of the other standard representations like latitude and longitude, um, and also well-known text and binary format, for example. And then the visualization nodes, I think you have seen them in the demonstration. Um, so they provide both, basically. So on the one hand, you have very stunning interactive visualizations, for example, with the Kepler view node, for example, and they also work in the, uh, as a web app. So you don't have that only in the NIME Analytics platform, but you can share that with all of your colleagues also. And then on the other hand, we will also have a static visualization that has very rich configuration options so that you can then produce nice images that you can integrate into presentations or reports or anything like this, for example. And thanks to the collaboration with the uh, Wendy's chair at Harvard, basically, I mean, we have the geospatial expertise they attend, right? And that's why we can provide then very sophisticated uh, analysis and modeling methods that cover then site selection, for example, and all other uh, kind of um, more complicated geospatial use cases also, if you need them. Um, and finally, 
which is also very important. I mean, we will provide then several nodes that allow you to access also uh, public available data sources, like the US Census data, for example, and also OpenStreetMap um, that you can use then in order to enrich your own data, um, data that you have in-house, basically. Okay, um, but we do not stop there. So what we will also do is we will provide a lot of different workflows and blueprints uh, for very common special use cases so that everybody, including also non-geospatial experts, can hit the count running by simply uh, adjusting the existing workflows and examples and adapt them to their data and their needs, basically. And in addition, Wendy's team and our um, learning or teaching experts, they will also work together in order to create a webinar that teaches you then geospatial analytics in NIME. Um, and that, as it's already mentioned, so that is a, at least a two-year collaboration project from Harvard and NIME uh, in the form of the Spatial Temporal, Spatial Temporal Innovation Center. Um, and we didn't start from scratch, of course. Um, that's why we want to acknowledge here these open source projects. So we built on top of these, like uh, OpenStreetMap and GeoPandas. And uh, with that, I want to thank all of you for your attention. And thanks a lot, Wendy, for coming here. And we are happy to take your question. And so please come up on stage, Wendy. Yes, let's bring Wendy Most back up on the stage, too, and give them both a hand. <laughs> this is uh, super exciting news as someone who just had a chance to just briefly dip my toes into geospatial analysis in grad school. I'm actually excited to start playing around with some of these nodes where they're going to be released. Um, so we're going to take a, probably just a couple of questions here because um, we're running a little bit short on time, but I want to make sure since this is brand new to everybody that if you do have a question about the extension of the capabilities that you have a chance to uh, throw that out there. Any questions from anyone? on the geospatial stuff. And, or maybe we have, some, oh, there's one over here on the side. And then I see Evan's got one there in the back as well. So we'll, we'll go here and then back to Evan. There we go. Tobias, uh, thank you. Quick question. I thought I heard you say that uh, support for shape files mm -hmm. is included. Is that the case? We can load shape files into NIME now? Yep. No, and you can also write out then shape files again. That's amazing. Yep. Awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. Great. And let's go back to Evan over here on the side. And then I think we will have time for one question for you online folks. We'll get to that too. Hi. Do you have uh, nodes built in to parse addresses into the geospatial coordinates or do you have to have an outside service for that? That's a very good question. So we don't have a note for that yet, but that's on the list very high and uh, uh, yeah, has a very high priority basically. Okay. And there we will integrate then with different services like OpenStreetMap, for example, also and other services for which you might need to have an API key because there are some limitations usually for these. But yeah, that's that's on the list. Okay. Okay, and then let's take this question from online in uh, mentions from the second use case, Wendy. It says, why did you use the straight line distance instead of the drive time or the drive distance? Very good question. We should have. Uh, well, that's not the, the real question. It's uh, because we were you know, limited by time to build a, a demo case uh, simplified enough just to show what can be done. Uh, but in real case, if we were to really study this problem uh, for, for decision making, uh, we would be using uh, network routing, drive time, or drive cost, uh, or a combination of them instead of uh, Euclidean distance. Fair enough, yeah. Excellent, fair enough. Thanks for taking that question. And thanks uh, for you online folks for continuing to submit those questions. We appreciate that. Okay, with that, we're gonna wrap the session up and move on to the next, but another uh, quick hand briefly for Wendy and Tobias. Thank you.